I'm Charles Powell. On behalf of our executive director, Lahaina Rosas, who is seated up front here in the Ansari Institute, welcome to the second installment of the Father Drew Christensen Lecture Series, Voices of Palestinian Christians. The Father Drew Christensen Lecture Series is coordinated by Churches for Middle East Peace and its Catholic Advisory Council. It is named after the late Reverend Drew Christensen, who served as director of the Office of International Justice and Peace of the U.S. Catholic Conference, now known as the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Additionally, Father Christensen was editor-in-chief of the Jesuit Weekly America. He taught at the Jesuit School of Theology, graduate Theological Union Berkeley and the University of Notre Dame, where he was a member of the founding team of the Kroc Institute of International Peace Studies. He was also a frequent consultant to the Holy See, as well as a member of the steering committee of the Catholic Peacebuilding Network. In a moment, you will hear from Dr. Bernard Sabella. Dr. Sabella is a retired associate professor of sociology from Bethlehem University in the Holy Land, where he taught for over 25 years. His academic interests focused on Palestinian Christians and questions of identity and other challenges, including the immigration of Christian Arabs from the Middle East, in 2006, he was elected to the Palestinian Legislative Council's Christian quota seat representing the city of Jerusalem. Prior to the outbreak of war, Dr. Sabella was going to join us on campus. Because of the war and due to possible power outages, Dr. Sabella has pre-recorded his lecture and you are about to hear it. Following the lecture, he will join us via Zoom, God willing, and I'm looking in the back at the laptop and I do see that he is with us now. He will join us for a time of Q&A. At that time, Dr. Sabella will be joined by Sir Jeffrey Aboud. Some of you were present at the first lecture in September that was presented by Sir Aboud. We call him Jeff. That's what I think he prefers for us to call him. Uh, Jeff chairs the Catholic Advisory Council of Churches for Middle East Peace and has been knighted by the Vatican into the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. I do encourage you to pick up his book and read it. It is titled A Great Cloud of Witnesses, The Catholic Church's Experience in the Holy Land. Additionally, Dr. Sabella and Jeff will be joined by the Reverend Anna Carlson. Reverend Carlson is the Senior Operations Director for Churches for Middle East Peace. We welcome you into this space today. The lecture is sponsored by the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, and it is co-sponsored by Churches for Middle East Peace the Bethlehem University Foundation, the Luke Institute for Asia and Asian Studies, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, and the Catholic Peace Building Network. Two of these institutions, I believe, require a quick introduction. First of all, Churches for Middle East Peace. Father Drew and Jeff served together on the Board of Churches for Middle East Peace. Churches for Middle East Peace is an NGO based in Washington, D.C. that has consultative status with the United Nations. Its stated mission is to encourage U.S. policies that actively promote a comprehensive resolution. I think the key word there is comprehensive. Resolution to conflicts in the Middle East with a focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Secondly, Bethlehem University Foundation. Known as an oasis of peace 
in a land that is so often characterized by conflict. Bethlehem University was created following the historic 1964 visit of St. Pope Paul VI to the Holy Land. The university is a joint venture between the Holy See and the De La Salle Christian Brothers. It is the only Catholic Christian university in the Holy Land. The mission of the university is to provide quality higher education to the people of Palestine and to serve them in its role as a center for the advancement, sharing, and use of knowledge. Bethlehem University aspires to foster shared values, moral principles, and dedication to serving the common good. Bethlehem University Foundation is the U.S. registered not-for-profit organization entrusted with a focus to assist Bethlehem University in the Holy Land to achieve its mission University in the United States as well. Once again, thank you for being a part of this very important and relevant conversation. Without further ado, I invite you to listen to Dr. Sutton. Initially, this intervention was supposed to be in person, part of honoring the late Father Drew Christensen. But then the war and the event overtook us, and we are doing it uh, via Zoom. A lot of efforts went, went into this particularly from CMEP staff, uh, people who worked diligently with me, with Julie, and with some of Notre Dame staffers, Croc School or Croc In Institute, uh, I hope I'm uh, saying it right, uh, who did a lot of things in order uh, to prepare for the in-person intervention, and now we have to do it via Zoom. So thank you all. Uh, the situation on the ground is horrendous, to say, to say the least. Uh, both uh, Palestinians and Israelis have suffered tremendously, both psychological, physical, and I would say infrastructure and ecological since October 7th. It's not time to say who is to blame, who is not to blame. But the results of the uh, war speak of over 1,600 Israelis who were killed, taken hostages, and hundreds of others injured or displaced. On the Palestinian side, you are talking about over 10,000 mostly children and women killed, and over 20,000 who have been injured, and a couple of thousands who are still under the rubble. And stories, really dramatic and tragic stories, keep coming back, recurring, of parents looking for their children under the rubble, or of families looking for their members, beloved members, under the rubble. Uh, there is an almost complete destruction of the habitat of uh, Gaza, 
and there is really a human, social, psychological, and ecological disaster. And these effects, especially the psychological effects of trauma, will accompany both groups for years to come. This situation is unthinkable. The scenario is one of an inferno in which the innocents became scapegoats for a violent confrontation that has apparently no possibility of exit. I have friends in Gaza, and I have come to know these friends through my work with the Middle East Council of Churches, Department of Service to Palestinian Refugees. And they have been working there, some of them, since the 50s, when the Palestine refugee problem was created. Now, in Gaza, you have 1,000 Christians. And from what I gathered talking to some of them when I could during the last few days, uh, what is left apparently today of the Christian population is no more than 800. And they are all, mostly all, lodged in the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches. Around 20% of Gaza Christian population, and this is a very, very rough estimate, uh, succeeded in exiting Gaza from the Rafah cross uh, point. And let me say that we are in pain. We are grieving and we are mourning in the Holy Land. On the Palestinian side, I feel mounting disappointment in the, with the response of the world community to the affliction caused by war on the Palestinian civilian population. In particular, Palestinians are disappointed with the U.S. position, despite of all what has been done, and with the European position, particularly as Palestinians witness around the clock scenes of horrendous and horrible killing of hundreds and hundreds of civilians, the wiping of whole neighborhoods, and the disregard for international humanitarian law. I'm not a military man, nor do I espouse violence or war, regardless of justification. As a Palestinian academic, this war comes in the context of the wider and historic conflict between Palestinians and Israelis, Arabs and Jews, if you wish, and it raises difficult and painful questions. First, is it possible really for Palestinians and Israelis to make peace only by themselves? Uh, I have heard over the years so many wise Western politicians who are seeking election or re-election, who are arguing that well, we can't do anything for uh, peace in Israel and Palestine. It's an insurmountable uh, problem, and let's not waste our time. 
And then on the other hand, some of these politicians would say, it's up to Israelis and Palestinians to make peace. And when Palestinians and Israelis are left alone, then you have issues and questions of imbalance of power, of uh, uh, Israel from a Palestinian perspective, doing what it wants with no willingness to, to take responsibility for any of its actions. And then you have the Oslo Accord, and people point to the Oslo Accord, and and nowadays people say, really, the Oslo Accords were born dead. And yet, out of Oslo came a kind of a, a accommod accommodation. I, I wouldn't say peace but accommodation between the PLO on the one side, which was once described as a terrorist organization, and the state of Israel. Yet, what happened in the on the ground after Oslo pointed to the fact that the Palestinian Authority, which to some of you who may not know, is the Palestinian government, in effect, in the West Bank, uh, has, be, has been weakened again and again by Israeli policy, especially the settlement in the occupied West Bank, but also by a kind of a, a, a weakening of, the, of this government, of this Palestinian government or Palestinian authority, by the fact that Israel dragged its legs on really achieving any kind of peaceful resolution, serious peaceful talk with the Palestinian authority. So the Palestinian authority was put aside it was propped up by the US, Europe, Israel itself for security purposes in order to coordinate that with Israel, but it was not given any, I would say, strong incentive in front of its people to be considered strong enough to uh, manage uh, the conflict with Israel, to manage in the sense to resolve the conflict with Israel, and to achieve certain political gains through a negotiated pro process. Uh, uh, some Israeli politicians did not help either, and they, perp on purpose, they followed a policy further weakening the uh, Palestinian Authority by strengthening or by accommodating themselves and their policies to the presence of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And the purpose was not to support Hamas, certainly not, but to have this division between Gaza Hamas and Ramallah Palestinian Authority. And it did, it did work. This policy did work for some time, but the sad thing about it is that this division was used not only by Israeli politicians, but also by European and American politicians to argue who speaks for the Palestinians? The Palestinians are divided, and therefore uh, nobody can speak for them. Not uh, the Palestinian Authority, not anyone else. Certainly, there were divisions within Palestinian society and politics, and I'm not discounting it, but I think the lack 
of political wisdom and political, uh, I would say, uh, stamina on the part of Israeli and some Western politicians, if you wish, have not contributed to dispel uh, this uh, division or to dispel this weakness uh, that Palestinians have come to see uh, the uh, Pal Palestinian Authority. Now, on October 7th, when the attack, when the Hamas attack took place, the US, Europe, and in fact, many other countries came to the support of Israel. It was clear that Israel was in a crisis. And it was clear also that the US was set to play a crucial role in consolidating or supporting Israel as it planned its war on Gaza. And this position uh, has been kind of a painful, painful position for the Palestinians because the expectation was that yes, uh, you, the United States, you are doing what you are supposed to do, but at the same time, you yourself and European politicians have been so lukewarm about advancing the peace process that now, all of a sudden, uh, with this tragic moment, terrible moment, you are in support of the one side at the expense, not of the Palestinians, but in my view, at the expense of a peaceful resolution that should have come years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't. So yes, there is a human tragedy nowadays. There is a psychological wound that is so traumatic that it is so difficult to overcome. And yes, my question is, what role to the US and to Europe, but particularly to the US. In the past, Israel has adopted a policy of managing the conflict. You manage the conflict and everything will be fine. You build the electronic surveillance uh, infrastructure and everything will be fine. You build a separation or security, call it whatever you want, fence, wall, separation wall, and you get everything fine. Uh, you do everything you want to control the population, and everything will go. This has not worked out. The tragedy of October 7th has shown that this has not worked out. Managing the conflict and not pursuing an active political decision making for peace, even by the US and Europe, have meant that Israelis and Palestinians are set to suffer, they are set to make more wars, and they are set to really a situation of mistrust and the impossibility in the minds of some of having a reconciliation, middle ground, and some kind of 
living side by side. Now, what do, what do I think? Uh, I think there is a need for a genuine peace process. Without a genuine peace process, we are going to be left alone here. And left alone, I mean Israelis and Palestinians, Palestinians and Israelis. And we are going to witness all cycles, recurring cycles of war, destruction, war, destruction. And all of us will pay a heavy cost. All of us. No one will be safe. So what should we do the day after? I think there should be a quick resumption of a peace process. And the quick resumption of the uh, peace process should be done uh, in order to implement quickly decisions that have been agreed upon by the two sides. We cannot discount any of the two sides. And uh, by the two sides, I mean Israel on the one side and the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority on the other. And, and this is important because without, without having the acceptance and agreement of the two sides, then you are going to impose. And imposing will not be accepted by anyone. The imposition of a government, first temporary government, is, is a, a no starter. You have to have an agreement to which Palestinians and Israelis subscribe to. Now, uh, some say, but uh, you know, the day after you are going to see Gaza totally desolated, destroyed, and so on. So, so when you when you talk about political scenarios for the day after, governing scenarios for the day after. Uh, you have, you have over 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 seventy percent of the Gaza population today displaced. Displaced. They are either in the south, or they are internally displaced within the small territory of northern Gaza. So, so what do you do? You come and uh, have a government. A, a, a imposed government on them, or let's say military rule, or military government. No, no, no. I think, I think the day after, and this is my uh, simple, maybe, maybe my simple suggestion. And I have spoken about it a couple of times. Gaza and Palestine, and I, I, I think also Israel is in need of a serious martial-like plan to come out of the rubble. So, so you have to work a political solution. At the same time, you have to work out a, a developed martial-like plan for the reconstruction of Gaza and for the rehabilitation of all kinds of physical, psychological, economic damage that have occurred uh, throughout this very, very uh, terrible conflict and war. So we cannot just simply say we can continue the way 
we were before October 7th? Certainly not. And yes, and yes, if the same policies continue within Israel with respect to the Palestinians, example, uh, West Bank settlement, example, the violence that we have seen lately by uh, Israeli settlers in the West Bank, uh, then, then uh, uh, this is not going to work out. It's not absolutely not going to work out. Certainly, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about international intervention as such, but there is a need for uh, people here in this holy land to hear what powerful states like the U.S. would have to say when it comes to the to a different future for both uh, Israeli and Palestinians. Allow me to to end by saying that the environment today is one of uncertainty. Some of us already question the wisdom of some Israeli politicians who worked for the division of Gaza, Hamas, from uh, Fatah, Ramallah, in the West Bank, to increase the intra-Palestinian division. Others question the failure of the Israeli establishment in preventing or preempting October 7th. Some also question the decision of Hamas military wing to wage the stupendous attack on October 7th. Others remain in a state of shock and trauma, feeling down and unwilling to grasp what is happening around them and in Gaza and its surroundings in specific. The times are difficult and the times are not normal. Even though the Holy Land is known for the miracles that happened within its found in the past, it seems that nowadays the miracle of peace is far fetched, as well as the other smaller miracles we would expect to happen in a land torn by conflict and war. Let us pray and hope for peace and harmonious living in the future even though this hope now appears so far distant. Because whether we like it or not, there is no other way. Thank you very much. So we do thank him for being up with us. We are going to now move into a time of Q&A. You see who is here in this audience. Additionally, Rebecca, we have how many online? Okay, so quite a few online. For those of you who have not had the opportunity to meet Rebecca Bell, which I think many of you know her, uh, she is our Program Director, Communications Director. Uh, she has helped bring this event into fruition. Thank you for your assistance in doing that. Dr. Sabella, thank you for joining us in person. I'm now going to invite uh, 
two of your colleagues to come up and join us as well. Sir Jeffrey Aboud and uh, Reverend Carlson, if you will please come. It is going to be paramount when you ask a question that you use a microphone so that everyone out there can hear what it is you are saying and so that our three panelists also hear what you are saying and can give you uh, the time and the thought uh, that you require. This mic that is on the table is live. You will be sharing that mic, okay? And I am going to take this mic and walk around. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have said to all of our panelists that uh, they can refrain from answering a question that they don't feel comfortable answering. But our panelists, uh, they are well-versed and they have much knowledge and wisdom and experience to share with you. <laughs> yeah, I just had a question more about if you could talk about the, the peace talks that do occur every once in a while. Seems like there's been several of them spread across decades. Do you know if they typically kind of start from scratch every time, or each new time do they say, well, these are the things we couldn't agree on, let's start with those, or if, if different leaders are meeting at each peace talk, can you just kind of speak more to that process of not why they break down so quickly, but just kind of like what happens semi-successfully during that? Can, uh, uh, can someone please repeat the question because of the echo? Yeah. Yeah. Always let him go first. Yeah. And now, as you know, a number of peace initiatives over the years, and they all failed because they were at the point where I So I think the, the biggest reason is it seems like all the peace processes so far have built on a political, been built on a political framework rather than a moral framework. And what I mean by that is, if you build a peace process on a moral framework, everybody comes to the table. So each party that comes to the table comes with rights that they want to see done. They have to acknowledge those rights. They have to come with them that there's a limit to those rights. So there's going to be a limit to have whatever you want. There's going to be a limit that will allow the fulfillment of the other party's legitimate rights that they bring also. That's never been the case. And building a political framework essentially means a party with the most political power is getting into the And then it never works. So we obviously need a new dynamic here. We're seeing the Catholic kind of this is a modern period. We're still in the moral framework and work from there. I think that's not the way to get into this. Um, that part of equality needs to be each other's evils. Where you start treating each other as equals. And hopefully, if you can have peace, well, that peace will last. Yeah, I mean, and also, you like something I'm going to show if you do our reconciliation. So that's kind of my answer. But yeah, the peace creation goes back. Well, there's some of them. Dr. Sabella, can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, I, I there, there is a lot of echo, and I have uh, written on the question and the answer that if someone needs to ask a question, so please text the question because I cannot I cannot hear because of the echo. It's a lot of echo. And and it's a problem with uh, it's a problem with everyone on Zoom, uh, and they can't they can't hear really the discussion at all. 
and and still on the screen uh, there is I am muted not on my screen on your screen oh. I, I am muted so please may the technician unmute me okay we'll work on that thank you Actually, not to bounce this question, but Charles might be the best person to answer this. Are you okay doing that? Are you okay too? Okay. Um, so, Christian Zionist evangelicals think the end of the world will come when um, Israel is restored and totally the opposite of the Catholic social teaching and just more principles that we've been from in the Catholic Church. Um, as Catholic and as a Christian, um, I think this is a starting point for this. And we hope our evangelical brothers would agree with us, um, and the politicians would agree with us. The first place we have to start is ceasefire, because I would think as Christians, our main principle is we're nonviolent and we want to see peace. And this is the only way to do it. If you want to be pro life, that includes more than just being. Uh, against abortion, but it includes end of life issues, it includes the human life, such as poverty or war. So, it would be the starting point, it would be our common humanity for evangelicals and Catholics, of course, Muslims and Jews also. Um, something we can all agree on um, would be stop killing people. At least let's start there, but it seems like as a nation, we can't even agree on that at this point. So, I will tell you a little bit about what Churches from Middle East Peace is working in that direction with um, kind of Yeah. One of the things that we've been doing, or we'll begin doing, is inviting folks to call in to their representatives on Mondays. We are offering a service through our website where the computer dials the phone number, there's a script there for you, and it will call each person. We're not asking questions. Okay. okay. If he sounds for me, that's on him, but I have my phone in the same. Okay, thank you. There's much more of a response when we get a phone call rather than an email or a letter that goes to the offices. So that's something that we're offering for free. Um, on Wednesdays, we've been holding prayer gatherings every week. Our half an hour Thursdays, our executive director, May Hannah, has been a briefing just what has been going on in the past week. Calling on Congress for a ceasefire now, a unilateral stopping. Um, and there will be other events in DC pulling together for the next couple of weeks as well. Um, can I go to the chat? Okay. Can I uh, can I come in and, and say a couple of uh, uh, sentences? Well, so you know. First of all, uh, really there is a serious uh, worrying on the part of uh, Palestinians, on our part, that what is taking place in the Gaza Strip these days specifically is an introduction to a new Nakba. And when we talk about Nakba, you point, uh, you, you know, you place the two sides. On the one hand, you have the Nakba, on the other hand, you have the establishment of the state of Israel. And one is on account of the other. And Nakba is really the displacement in 1948 of over 726,000 Palestinian refugees. A good number of them ended up in the Gaza Strip. And that explains the high de population density on the Gaza Strip, 
and it explains also the hopelessness of young people, no justification whatsoever uh, with what happened. Now, the, this fear of really a, a Nakba, a new Nakba, a new displacement of a majority of Palestinians is something uh, that is in our psyche. People really talk about that like when you talk in the US about whether you're going to have coffee or not to have coffee this morning. And people are really so traumatized by this that they are worried that this may happen. Now, we are also concerned here over what is going to happen really, uh, what is happening and what will continue to happen on relationships between Palestinians and Israelis. And this is very, very uh, uh, important topic. Uh, do we turn from each other? And if we turn from each other, then what? And what are the prospects? So you start with Gaza and you end up with the West Bank. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, neither Egypt nor Jordan would want more refugees. They have had enough in Jordan. They have had enough, sorry to say the word, enough of refugees, whether Syrian, Iraqi, or Palestinians. And Egypt, you have a lot of security issues and security concerns. So it's not that uh, neither Jordan or Egypt would want to help. It's basically it's basically a variety of uh, causes and factors that prevent them. One of them is really the insistence of both Jordan and Egypt that Palestinians should stay in their home country, whether it is Gaza or the West Bank. Now, uh, uh, one last comment here is whether the U.S. People say, why Why should you need the U.S.? And I heard a, a presidential candidate uh, saying, uh, we, we should not uh, get involved in the Middle East at all. Uh, it's like uh, saying uh, the word has become really uh, not important for the U.S.A. You are not part of this world. You are not part of what's happening in the Middle East. And I, and, and I feel that my concern is that the U.S. will not be able to convince the Israelis that going back to managing the conflict will not work out. And that there is a need for a permanent, peaceful resolution of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians so that we will never again have the kind of event and tragedies that happened since uh, October 7th. I stop here. Other questions from the audience? My name is Peter. I'm a member of 1962 graduate of Notre The question involves the Hamas or the involvement of Iraq in this situation. To what extent are they influencing the conflict and could influence the Palestinians by themselves and the Israelis by themselves could be worked out? Uh, can you repeat the question or type it? Someone type it, please text it. Uh, on the question and answer, or uh, I wish we had a, a blackboard or a green board or a whiteboard. To what extent and Iraq involved? Uh, 
uh, no, you don't mean Iraq. You mean Iran, Hamas Sorry. and Iran. Well, yes, I mean, you know, the conflict is between Israel and Hamas, you know. Uh, whether Iran has been actively uh, uh, planning this, I cannot comment because I, I don't know. I don't follow Iranian politics, nor do I follow uh, Iranian Hamas politics as such. But the question uh, tends to uh, put the blame. Yes, you can put the blame here or there and say, okay, because they did this, then the other side is justified in doing that. And I heard this argument uh, since October 7. And in a sense, it pains me. And, and here I would like to, to, uh, to bring in what a South African friend of mine told me one time. Uh, when I asked him, why don't you, as taking over from the white regime, why don't you uh, do to the white regime what they did to you? And the guy surprised me, nicely surprised me by saying, if we do it, how much better are we than the whites who created the apartheid system. So you cannot, in such a situation, and I'm not justifying anything here, but you cannot, in such a situation, argue this or argue that and say the blame is here and the blame is not there. Uh, because both sides uh, would present the, their their own narrative, their own way of explaining things, and it's going to be a vicious uh, circle. Uh, in my view, what we need to do is to get out of this. And I know the time is running short, but allow me, and, and maybe then there would be uh, more questions to the, uh, to the distinguished panelists, and I would like to hear uh, that. Uh, I was reading some time ago a small article, a short article, written by no other than the late Edward Said. And it is called Inve Invention, Memory, and Place. And it was published in Critical Inquiry uh, in winter of 2000. And allow me to quote what he said because I think this tragedy we are all living in this holy land makes what he said 23 years ago quite pertinent and relevant today. He said, and I quote, yet there can be no possible reconciliation, no possible solution, unless these two communities confront each others experience in the light of the other or confront each's experience in the light of the other. And he concludes, and I read, again I quote, let me note in a very brief conclusion what the interplay among memory, place, and invention can do if it is not to be used for the purposes of exclusion, that is, if it is to be used for liberation and coexistence between societies whose adjacency, adjacency requires, adjacency meaning being adjacent to each other, like we are in the Holy Land, Palestinians and Israelis, requires a tolerable form of sustained, sustained reconciliation. Again, and, and, and this is Edward Said, I want to use the Palestinian issue as my concrete example. Israelis and Palestinians are now so intertwined, and this has also been repeated by Israeli scholars and authors, 
through history, geography, and political actuality, that it seems to me, to Edward Said, absolute folly to try and plan the future of one without that of the other. I mean, regardless of how you appraise or you think or you talk or you, the popular image you have of Edward Said, here it is. He's saying it 23 years ago. And, and some, uh, some Palestinians would be surprised to hear him say that. But he was saying it. You cannot make the future to the exclusion of the other side. And I, I wish and pray that U.S. politicians, and some people say, why U.S. politicians? Well, because the most important visit after October 7th to Israel was from President Joe Biden. And it gave all kinds of support, not simply military uh, and moral and spiritual and psychological and whatever, but it gave also uh, actual support, military support. So, so if you say, well, the U.S. will leave it up to Israel and the Palestinians to make it, uh, I, I'm very sorry, uh, this will not go. And again and again, we'll have disasters, we'll have misfortunes, we'll have uh, violent confrontations, and it will never end. And it is the time now for, for people in the USA for politicians in the USA, not simply to say stop the war, but to be weary of any attempt at mass deportation and displacement, and to be weary that going back to managing the conflict and managing the occupation will not make peace in this holy land. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabella. We have time for just one more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up before going to our reception. Um, but I believe you had a question, yes? Well, why has the Christian exodus from Palestine been so much faster than the Muslim exodus? It's been consistent over decades. Uh, uh, although the crisis affects all Palestinians equally, uh, Christians have left much, in much greater number than Muslims, and I wonder why that is. Um, yeah, so the uh, Christian population historically in all Iran has been about 18%. It's about 1.5% today. Dr. Sabella yep. said there's less than 1,000 in Gaza right now. Um, the main reasons, and Dr. Sabella actually led the research on this, um, the biggest reasons are immigration. They're leaving. It's not like they're staying and get diluted out by the Jewish and Muslim populations. Um, they're leaving. So why are they leaving more? Um, because they live in such an impressive environment and occupation, a lot of times those who can get out, get out. And Christians tend to be We lost the sound. We lost the connections in the West. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. If they can leave, they leave. And uh, that's the biggest immigration in the sea. Little conditions they face in the West Bank and Gaza is discrimination they face. Well, when you when the question on Christian immigration, I mean, you know, the original lecture I was supposed to give was really on relations between a majority and uh, minority uh, uh, groups uh, within society. Uh, unfortunately, this was impossible. Maybe next year, if God wills it, if God wills it. But uh, but historically, historically, uh, Christians uh, were much more ready to move because uh, at the beginning they had access to missionary schools, quote unquote. Uh, they were uh, <laughs> they knew the languages of Europe, and so it was uh, it was natural for them 
to raise their expectations by uh, leaving uh, countries of uncertainty, okay? And then you had all the conflagrations that happened in the Middle East during the last 20 years since the first uh, Iraq war. Uh, so a variety of factors have entered into, uh, into pushing uh, uh, not only Christians, but really middle class, uh, Middle Easterners to go West uh, and you find them all over the place. So, uh, but this needs uh, a different a different webinar. Thank you, Dr. Salah. Um, do you, Reverend, do you have any final words? you to find me out in the reception. Uh, we would love to be able to provide you with resources for how you might be able to engage. Uh, calling is one step, but we have other action alerts and statements that we've been putting out. Our board is comprised of 30 member denominations. It's Catholic, Methodist, Evangelical, Flavors. Um, it's quite a broad spectrum and they've all come together on um, these guiding principles and it's with one voice that they put out these statements and so I think we need to get it there now. Uh, I think we need to be as a board at this point just because we want to be sure that we are paying attention and not looking away. Um, so is that there is the luxury of the privilege and I fully feel that um, we are privileged and we have a voice and I think we have a responsibility to keep those in power. And, um, I would love to talk more one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Not much for microphones, I apologize. Reverend, sir, and with religion and our co-sponsors, once again, they are Churches for Middle East Peace, the Bethlehem University Foundation, the Little Institute for Asia and Asian Studies, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, and the Catholic Peace Building Network. Thank you for your participation, both in the Egg Visitor Center as well as online. I do invite you to join us for a reception in the lobby. Uh, there, as you just heard, the conversation can continue. Thank you all. Good evening.